Um, as we're uh, already running a bit late, I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, but uh, now we want to go on um, talking about some fuzzing, as uh, Dan already um, touched on. And he, I think, already uh, brought up some of the very interesting issues that also came up for our work and also the um, problems that we are tackling because of those um, observations. For example, what he was talking about is that we kind of need systems to be uh, easily fast testable for in order for us to be able to test them. And the other thing that he said is that uh, there are different kinds of input types that we have. And we're going to talk about um, pretty different ones that you might be interested or then you might be expecting or uh, then you might know yourself uh, in here and which are very interesting from, from my point of view and which I have um, uh, put some research into. So this uh, talk is called Fuzzware, Automating and Scaling Fuzzing for Firmware. And um, this talk in a nutshell is going to be something like this. Uh, so we want to take in some firmware from um, binaries that uh, come for um, IoT um, platforms or little small embedded systems, which are just a bit smaller than what you would expect and have a bit of a different format than what you would normally be used to. And then we put this kind of firmware into uh, the cloud and there is a lot of things going on, um, but we will get into this later. And then we want to get bugs out of it. And uh, this talk is about um, how uh, can we achieve this and shed some light on this. So first of all, who are we? Uh, we in quotation marks here for the moment as I get into. My name is Toby. I'm a PhD student at Ruhr University Bochum. I'm uh, also a CTF player, Pontoon participant before, and I'm interested in binary exploitation and reverse engineering. In my um, uh, research, I'm focusing on firmware here. Normally, uh, Marius also wanted to um, join us here, but uh, he sadly cannot due to COVID reasons, but he's recovering quickly, and uh, he's also sending his greetings. All right. First of all, uh, let's understand uh, a bit about systems that we are going to talk about today. Um, embedded systems. So what do we understand by embedded systems? A lot of you might uh, think about something like a router, um, that they have at home, anything that's um, kind of close to what they're using. And those systems, uh, what they do is um, they run Linux a lot. And sometimes, or most of the time, it's a bit of a boiled down Linux in the form of a busy box or so. But then uh, we figure out um, this type of embedded system is not the only one. And um, there are a lot of other systems out there with uh, very different properties. As we can see here, we have uh, different types of embedded systems. Uh, some PLCs here, which you would uh, find in a factory deployment or an ECU, which you would find in a car. And then finally, uh, on the further right, you find some home automation appliances, which get smaller and smaller. Uh, what all these devices have in common, that they usually do not run any Linux. So they are very hard to kind of uh, grab your hand on, but we still want to have some um, security analysis of these as well. Um, and we'll get into why uh, this is uh, a bit tricky to do and how different ways that uh, we could uh, go about doing that and analyzing them. So first of all, in uh, order to do this, we want to understand how do these systems actually talk uh, to the hardware around it. Because if we do not have a Linux system, um, kind of the hardware still has to uh, be talking to or be spoken to by the firmware. And we cannot just have a Linux syscall and then have a read or something that we can get our input. We do not have a file system, things like that. What do we do in this scenario? And uh, as it turns out, we have three main ways of communication between the firmware image and then um, the hardware that's surrounding it. And uh, one of these is uh, called memory mapped input and outputs or MMIO for short. And what this is basically doing, it's, it's a ma magic memory region, which doesn't really represent any RAM as you would um, see it in a normal uh, computer. If you have just RAM memory, you write something in, you read it out and you get back whatever you got. But instead, what is behind this is an actual device and it's talking to you. And depending on whether you do a read on this magic uh, memory region or uh, you do a write, you can either find something out about the state or read some data out of uh, this peripheral or uh, you can put some configuration in. And this very much depends on how this uh, MIO is laid out, but we'll talk about this in a bit. The second uh, mechanism uh, which we have at our disposal for talking between firmware and hardware is interrupts. And this is basically a doorbell sign where the hardware can tell the firmware, okay, buddy, I have something going on, please check on me. 
And so what's happening in the firmware then is often that you have something that's called a, uh, an interrupt um, handler and the interrupt handler will check on the device using MMIO and see, okay, what's going on? Do I have a new network packet coming in or things like that? Um, and then we have the third kind of mechanism, which is called direct memory access or DMA for short. And uh, here we have uh, some communication mechanism for high throughput uh, scenarios where we have something like an Ethernet card which has to run very uh, rapidly or um, USB or things like that. And um, in these cases, what the firmware and the hardware do is basically um, they unify on a, a memory region which they want to talk uh, through and then they can both simultaneously read and write uh, to this memory region. And then of course, for example, if the uh, if a device wanted to send something like an Ethernet frame and make it available to the firmware, it could just write something into an Ethernet frame buffer and then give a, an interrupt and then the firmware knows, okay, now I can access this directly without having to use MMIO to like uh, finically read out every byte one after the other. And um, this is what kind of reading input would look like for us from a normal like fuzzing perspective, for example. We have a get char, so we want to read a single byte uh, of user input. And this is pretty straightforward in Linux. What we can do is just have a read syscall, uh, pass in standards in as the file descriptor zero, and then just get our value back and return it from the function. However, if we look at the same thing now for um, the serial interface of an embedded controller, for example, this would look much more complex in this case. And we uh, can see that uh, we have already uh, talked about some MIO, and here we can see that three different MIO registers are actually involved in reading this. And so it's much more involved to do, and we have some talking to the hardware to do in here as well. And we'll go into what exactly this is doing um, in a bit, um, but let's skip this for now. So with these kind of um, basic things out of the way, uh, then we want to go to rehosting. And uh, first of all, um, we want to define what rehosting is. So um, I just read it out here. It's the automatic creation of virtual execution environments for embedded firmware. So what we basically want to do, we want to take some piece of firmware out of the device and run it somewhere on the general purpose system. For example, an emulator, something like that. And, and there are many reasons for this, uh, for why we would want to do this. And we could go into all of these details and we actually wrote the paper about it. Remember, I'm dabbling in uh, some academia, but we do not want to do it here. And instead, we want to um, take it down to something a bit uh, more streamlined and maybe easy to understand and also the main reason, quite frankly, why we want to do this. So on the one hand, we have those smart things, so-called smart things, such as a lightning bulb or um, a temperature sensor. And these things, we do not really get an SSH shell onto there. We cannot deploy AFL and then just run some, some binary on there. We have to have a, a bare metal um, system which just doesn't allow us anything uh, in the traditional means. And um, they are very slow as well. So uh, I just got told uh, outside here that somebody actually tried to fast test the router, for example, and that the chip was actually like brown afterwards. So that's uh, very cool to hear. So maybe we also don't, don't want to like uh, blow these things up uh, in the first place. And uh, if we turn to something more powerful, like like clock computation, then we can just deploy it on a massive scale and whenever we get it into an emulator and actually are able to do this, then um, uh, we can get fuzzing to um, to a very potent level here. All right, so uh, with these things, you might say, okay, Toby, you already said it, we have an emulator, we have the cloud, uh, we can just combine this, right? So we just take uh, the emulator that we already have, it's very good, uh, it's scalable, and uh, it's a community project which is uh, developed and very mature. Why can't we just plug the firmware into QEMU and then just uh, do some fuzzing on this, uh, put some cloud service behind it, and the bugs will fall out eventually, right? Um, but there, sadly, is a bit of a challenge with this, and this challenge is mainly uh, uh, consisting of the complexity of hardware devices that we are facing. And so if we think about the different vendors uh, that would uh, present or um, offer some uh, device like this, uh, every one of those vendors will um, have different devices that they offer. And then for every device, we have different peripherals. It wants to have timers. It wants to have a serial interface. It wants to talk via Wi-Fi and things like that. So we have all these different peripherals. And then afterwards, each peripheral also has different memory registers. And this kind of multiplies up. And if we 
uh, kind of see what this entails in, in the documentation, which we sometimes have available, not always, then we can see it, uh, the details are not really important here, but we can see that uh, there are device regions and each uh, device region has a peripheral region and each, and then, which we do not even see here, it's different MIO registers, so kind of explodes. And um, some of these uh, devices are fully implemented. If we look at some system, for example, uh, a very well-established one like in Raspberry Pi, we have a full implementation of all these registers. But it's a huge amount of work. And uh, if we think about that, we have all these small uh, little devices which do not uh, really are not really covered by this, um, then we might not even find an implementation in something like QAMI. And um, then what makes it kind of worse is that in a lot of cases, we do not even have documentation. So even if we wanted to comb through like a thousand page document, which describes all these things, then we couldn't do it even if we wanted, if we do not have documentation in the first place. So this kind of begs the question, we have so many devices and we want to secure the firmware that is running on them and it's very hard to analyze them. So how can we automate emulating these systems uh, in the end? And as it turns out, different people have looked at this problem before and how can we kind of model this hardware for systems that are not quite Linux-like systems and we cannot use any abstractions um, that we are used to and cannot really apply the tools um, that we are used to as well and which have also proven uh, very reliable sources of, um, of bug finding. And so one of the first things that I would like to mention here is uh, what is called Pretender. So what they basically try is to take a piece of hardware, run it, and take some traces from it, and then try to understand, uh, based on the traces that we have seen and that we know are valid, can we figure out how the hardware behavior works. And then people took it a bit further with p squared m and part emu, where you take it in a fully like, virtual domain, you do not uh, use any hardware anymore, but you uh, see what the access patterns are in something like QEMU, but QEMU without actual devices. And then you kind of monitor what uh, communication is going on, and then you may be able to derive from uh, these access patterns what the behavior should be. And then people took it even further, uh, where we use some um, program analysis techniques, um, like symbolic execution, um, to do this kind of modeling for us. So whenever we have an access, can we figure it out by um, analyzing this success and then seeing, okay, does the code tell us something about what we supposed uh, to do? And then, of course, we're in 2022 and we have Fuzzware, and this is kind of the prototype that uh, we want to talk about and the work uh, that I've been performing. Um, all right. So Fuzzware, rehosting via the Fuzz and the loop. So let's recap for a bit. Uh, what have these previous works done uh, on a kind of um, broader level? So these, uh, these prototypes have looked at this problem in a two-step way. So first of all, what we want to do is we take a piece of firmware and then we rehost it so that we can run it in an emulator. And then afterwards, we can uh, put a fuzzer to it and uh, have the fuzzer uh, do the security auditing for us. And um, our the question kind of that's begging here is, can we also integrate the fuzzer from the start? Can we not treat it as a two-way process, but uh, have the fuzzer in the, um, in the loop um, directly? So the idea behind this uh, would be that uh, m modern fuzzers are already very good at kind of identifying what is useful for a program. So we can take something like coverage feedback, and whenever we find coverage feedback within uh, a program, then something is likely or an input is likely to be useful for it. And um, the idea here is can we use this for modeling as well? Can we just have the fuzzer do the heavy work for us and, um, and do this? But this, again, if we think about this a bit more, it uh, has some issues uh, concerned with it. And um, the first thing is that while not fully random, fuzzers uh, still rely on a lot of uh, like die rolling a dice, basically. If you look at the source code of AFL or AFL++, it's not quite 100% random, but um, the mutations try to um, modify it in a lot of ways, and what comes out is that, uh, more or less a random behavior. And then, um, this makes it very hard if you have a lot of choices to kind of find the right thing in the first place. And firmware makes it a bit harder still because as we will see, um, there is a lot of low level like firmware and hardware chatter going on, which kind of explodes the state space a lot, which is kind of needlessly so. And uh, we'll see what this means here. So let's look at a code example. And um, what you can see on the left side, it's uh, a function called perform op. And then on the right side, we have the control flow graph or CFG. Um, that represents the different paths through it. So what we can see is that we have an MIO operation, 
uh, register which is queried. So the firmware will look, okay, what kind of operation does the uh, hardware want to do or what state is it in? How should I behave um, based on that? And um, depending on what operation comes in, we can step through this and see, okay, if we uh, do the default case, it would do some housekeeping with, an, uh, with some uh, coverage here assigned to it. Then we come to the B case and there is some special handling to it. Depending on the status, if it's special, then there is some special handling and otherwise we have the default one. So we can step through this as well. So as we said, the idea is to kind of involve the fuzzer in here. So what do we do if, um, or how does this look like in case uh, the fuzzer is choosing some values for us? And as I said, there is some randomness in here. So we can kind of say, okay, we just pick some values. It's not um, quite random in the normal case, but we just pick some random values here. And then we can see, okay, what kind of picks did we get? And we can highlight them here and then plot them in this coverage um, here. And uh, the greener or the more dark green uh, coverage uh, node is, the more it was visited. And as we can see, we have some parts of this uh, coverage not even um, occurring at all. And this might be problematic in case we have a bug hiding in some special case, for example, we do not get any coverage out of here. So uh, this kind of begs the question or brings up this uh, idea of the paradox of choice. So on the one hand, we want to give the fuzzer all the flexibility in the world. We do not take away any parts because especially the uh, specific or special parts could contain bugs as well. But at the same time, if we give it too big of a search space, then we cannot really do anything. And the question or the fuzzer will not be able to find them. And um, the question here is, um, can we reduce these available choices a bit? And this is where a little Toby on the start of the academic work uh, started going on the internet looking for some uh, some quotes uh, for inspiration. And the first one that he found was, look for chances to take the less covered parts. And uh, we had a second from the same author. Uh, we do not still or yet know who it was. It was, you will regret the parts you didn't cover. And then at the end, also a keep it simple, stupid. And as it turns out, was already called our Lord and Savior by Dan before in the keynote, it was of <laughs> course AFL, the little fuzzing uh, American fuzzy lob. And this kind of got me thinking. So you have uh, keep it simple, stupid. So can't we kind of make this life of the fuzzer easier? Just make it simpler. And um, this is where kind of the idea stems from. And uh, we can look at what this entails and looking at this code again. Um, so if we look at this code as we went through, it was a case A, case B, and a default case kind of scenario. So what the fuzzer should kind of be aware of is that there are three choices. We do not really have a big search space. We have just three choices based on our MMIO. And what if we change this representation for uh, the little bunny a bit here, and then uh, we just gray out the ones which do not matter. So we just have A, B, and C, and B is the representative for the default case here. And if we uh, just let um, the fuzzer choose between one of these three, uh, options now, what we can do is go through the same scenarios again. And then we get uh, A and B here, and then we get to, or A and default, and then we get to the B case. And uh, what is interesting is that we have the same kind of situation here as well. We can kind of nest this idea. So here we have an, another if-else statement, depending on uh, whether we want the status, uh, the special case or not the special case. And um, this is, again, just a choice between special and not special. So what do we give the fuzzer? If we could find a, some modeling approach which just gave us one of these two choices, we could just have the fuzzer uh, choose the one or the other. And the interesting thing is that now it's much easier for the fuzzer to find all these different um, coverage paths and um, this allows us to find bugs mainly. Alright, this brings us to uh, the modeling component of uh, fuzzware and the different models and as it turns out we have already seen one. So this is what we call the set model. It's, um, it just gives the fuzzer, pre-computes a set of choices, and then the fuzzer can just choose between them uh, based on some byte of fuzzing input, for example. And uh, let's complete this picture a bit. So we have some more models in here. Um, so let's uh, look at this uh, serial get C function again and uh, go through these different lines a bit in more detail. So here, what we can see is that, first of all, the firmware has to make sure that the hardware actually has some data available, so it uh, stays in a busy loop until this data is available. And it will actually get stuck in this busy loop until the data is available. And um, in case we want to do fuzzing, it's clear we do not want to get stuck in any loops, we just want to go on. So what we do here is apply what we call a constant model and just have the 
the excess return, it has data. If we can show by some analysis that this is just um, being stuck in the loop without anything happening, then we can safely just assign uh, the constant value and not have to involve the fuzzer. So this, in this case, we make it really simple for the fuzzer because it doesn't have to do anything in this case. And um, the interesting thing here is that uh, we have an, a four byte excess before, so the fuzzer would have given us four bytes, but now we have just zero because we can handle it on our, by ourselves. And um, this kind of applies to um, the second um, here as well. Uh, what we have here is that we have a GPIO value, which represents something like an LED lighting up and indicating uh, some activity on the serial interface, for example. And um, this is what we what we can see here is that um, this hardware value is first read, then modified and written back. And everything kind of stays in the hardware domain. So we do not really care about this because the firmware doesn't take anything into account in its logic. And if we can show this again, we can just uh, uh, keep this as a normal memory access here. We call this a bus to model. So whenever the firmware writes something and reads it back, it gets the same value. And the fuzzer still doesn't have to be involved in here. Um, and then finally, we have this data access. We see we have a four byte access first, but then we are masking off only one byte. So we only have to um, have the fuzzer give us one instead of four. And kind of if we summarize this, uh, we can reduce the input uh, space by uh, quite a bit because the fuzzer before it had to uh, deal with all these different things and without changing the program logic, we can just reduce it by over 90%. And um, kind of what we had have now is we have a function which takes one byte of input and just takes one byte of fuzzing input as well. So it's very familiar to the fuzzer now as it would look like in a, on a Linux system, for example. All right, if we put this together in a little diagram here, uh, we have the um, we have full system overview. So in the middle, if you're not familiar uh, with it, it's um, the emulator called Unicorn Engine. And what it gives you is um, basically uh, instruction execution without any hardware components around it. So it's a script version of QM in, at its core. And what it's doing is just um, executing the firmware image. And then whenever there is any hardware accesses, it just forwards it to the puzzle again. And then if we see any hardware access which we have not seen before, uh, what we can do is have uh, symbolic execution in this case, our modeling components um, perform some analysis and see whether we can fit one of these models which we have seen before. And um, this kind of gets uh, fed back into the emulator while it's running and then it can afterwards handle um, some of the excesses transparently or boil them down and so on. And it's kind of a loop uh, going on as soon as long as uh, we have more MMIO registers or kind of hardware interfacing that has not been previously discovered. And um, what we did is that we wrote a kind of complex prototype for this. Uh, it's about 10,000 lines of source code, and uh, it's also available on GitHub. Um, so with this, of course, let's get fuzzing. And um, what is important for fuzzing is obviously, and as an academic especially, to have very novel ideas about how to go about fuzzing. So having to set up something and then fuzzing something and afterwards triaging crashes is something that nobody would ever have come up before with before. So uh, we in the academia are all about giving some novel ideas to everybody, right? So uh, that's uh, what we did here. Now, of course, uh, what we at least do is that we supply some um, uh, utilities for what we already know uh, is required to do this fuzzing workflow. And um, without like going into these uh, right now in uh, just theory, let's look at some examples here. And I have a little demo um, prepared. So what does it look like to use Fuzzware? So first of all, we want to do a, a work on Fuzzware. So we're actually in the virtual environment to use it. And then we want to configure, um, set up configuration for the binary file using Fuzzware gen config. And then uh, we can see we have some configuration files uh, created. And I can now use the pipeline component to do some fuzzing. So after some setup, what we can see that, as we would expect, we have some um, some coverage coming in, uh, some translation blocks or basic blocks being discovered. And what we can see afterwards is that we also have some uh, models uh, being created. Um, so this is the the modeling component feeding back some configuration snippets to um, the emulator, which is then consumed by the emulator to set it up for, for a more efficient um, fuzzing workflow. And then if we wait for a little bit more, uh, we find some more coverage afterwards as would be expected. And this is where we can also uh, stop the puzzle for the 
um, purpose of this demonstration. Then what we can see, uh, we have a fuzzer project directory which contains all these uh, results from the fuzzing. And um, here we can uh, query fuzzer cough uh, so that we can see um, what kind of functions have we already covered. And we can also replay an input um, based on coverage here and get the behavior of it. And the second thing that we can kind of look at is a is the, the models that were created themselves. And we can see in the MIO, this for config.yml, we have different ones of these uh, models, a constant pass-through, there's a set model in there as well, and so on. So, And then, of course, if we have uh, run this for a bit longer time and not only 30 seconds, we can go into a project which has run for a little bit longer time and went through some configuration updates, and then we found some crashes, for example. Then we can also replay and analyze these crashes afterwards and look at what the behavior is. And then we can see here um, that we have the, the crash state and then can see what the reason for it was. And in this case, we can see it's a bit of a messed up PC. So um, this is a stack-based buffer flow in this uh, example. But we're not going to go into this exactly. OK, this is that for the demo. And um, mm -hmm. let's go and look for some bugs that we found with it. Um, so first of all, it's important what kind of system did we choose in the first place. And um, uh, as it turns out, what we found interesting is kind of the uh, the systems which other firmware uses afterwards to build upon and um, then have some embedded operating systems which come with a network stack um, which then allow uh, small power devices to be connected. And these are uh, implementations um, of such operating systems which are connectivity driven. So Sapphire, RTOS, and then Contiki and G on the other end. And um, it comes with a lot of um, connectivity features, something like Bluetooth, low energy, Wi-Fi, 6 low pan. Um, different companies are behind this because they are interested in having a joint core of uh, high quality software, of course, and they also have a, a security development lifecycle and the team was, is also very cool to work with. So great projects, uh, both of them. And we found some bugs in here and we want to actually look at those. And, um, as we cannot go into all these bugs in detail, we want to frame them in the terms of famous last words or what the firmware assumption could have been just before this kind of issue occurred. So the very first one, let's start with this. It says, uh, these two objects will never be the same, which kind of resulted in one of the bugs which we had. Then we have the second one. We know something about something like a data structure or so in the program, and we can just do that, right? We can optimize our algorithm to do just that, uh, work on these assumptions and make everything run uh, very fast, for example. And this also um, resulted in some bugs. And then we have somebody else who surely have initialized this or will surely initialize this. Uh, and if, especially across uh, API boundaries, if you find something like this, it, it very much uh, lends itself to bugs. And then does anybody have an idea of what kind of category uh, could be there as well? It has to do with something that I think a lot of people have seen before. This length can never be smaller than. This was, this was actually something that occurred a lot. And then there is the King's category, of course this length can never be larger than so anything with mi missing bounds checks. And one of these um, bugs that I uh, that we encountered, I would like to spotlight a little bit here. And this uh, occurred in the 6 low pan fragment reassembly. And uh, for some context, 6 low pan is kind of the, the way that um, smart and constrained devices can uh, use to talk IPv6 to each other. So what they can do is send, they can send small frames over the over the air, but they are pretty small. So what you have to do is to plug different fragments together uh, so you can have a full IPv6 packet. And so uh, what the standard says is that you have kind of a frag1 uh, fragment and then frag n fragments. So one is the first and then the follow-up frames. And as everything goes over the air, you cannot really rely on something to come in uh, in a specific order. So what you have to do is just um, you take everything in and then have to reorder it afterwards. And so then it's kind of a a good thought to have. We already have a pre-sorted list, right? We have a frag one, so it's always at the beginning. So what we're doing is not really sorting a list, but we are sorting a list with the first element already in fixed place. And we can just assume that the first element just doesn't change. And it turns out if you generate an algorithm for this and um, do the sorting, what comes out at the end is, is an infinite data structure. It's a ring instead of something that's finite. And now you have an assumption about something being a finite data structure, and you start working on this. And this is where things get a bit weird here, um, because 
you what you have to do in six lopan uh, in order to put together the fragment data is that you have to strip the fragment headers from all of these different fragments and um, you have to do it once but you can do it once by just going through this finite list of course and if it's a ring afterwards it's no longer finite so you turn it into an infinite header removal packets get smaller and smaller over time the integer of the size just gets negative you have a really big mem copy and then the firmware is not really happy about what comes afterwards and um, the actual crash um, triaging here was a very interesting uh, process. I find this quite interesting because I am sure I've looked at this kind of functionality before and just to understand kind of what is going on in the uh, network layer and uh, I'm sure I, I've missed this kind of bug here. And um, the, the whole triaging process was pretty uh, involved and I tried to uh, dry running this with Marius and telling him about it but it, uh, was kind of resulting in uh, this scenario. And he said, okay, maybe we should not go into all these details. So I'm sparing you these details here. Um, but instead, we want to get to some closing thoughts. And um, first of all, of course, uh, what are the boundaries of what we can do or what we want to do here as well? Um, so first of all, it's a research prototype we have uh, implemented for ARM Cortex M. We are working on extending it, but for the moment, it's uh, working on a very popular platform, but obviously, it doesn't cover all of them. And um, then there are also special cases in firmware which we are just not this uh, um, this way of um, looking at this MIO modeling does not really cover because DMA is uh, just a different beast. It's an interesting problem, but something that we do not really cover here. And also, if we have some very specific assumptions about timings, um, then uh, things can get messed up as well. For example, the um, the emulator tries to make things go as quickly as possible, of course, but then at some points, for example, if you wait for some initialization or you are sure some device takes for a bit longer time, we may not always uh, scale the timing in a correct manner so that things can come too early logically or maybe even too late logically. So if we have uh, situations like this, um, some modifications are required. Manually. And then, of course, there's a bit of common sense in here. So in case you have a Linux system, um, and you can use what tools you have already available, just use the tools you have already available. So um, that should work. And, and then finally, one thing I would like a vision of mine that I would like you to take home. It has to do a little bit, uh, has to do something with a bug, uh, with a duck. And, uh, here it goes. If we want to convince firmware to walk like possible software and then also quack like possible software, then uh, we might someday be able to actually give the tools to the embedded uh, firmware development guys to uh, to do uh, the fuzzing themselves and find all these bugs so we don't have to do it for them because currently we do not really supply them with the tools to be able to do it. And if we can do this, we can find a lot of bugs in the process. And uh, with this thought, I would like to thank you for the attention and uh, more open for questions. Test. So, if I understand correctly, you drop in a firmware that you have no presumptions about, and then it will automatically find out what hardware MMIO it does. But how do you deal with stuff that actually changes? Like, for example, if we take uh, a Game Boy, for example, and we have like bank switching, so you write to an address and that changes RAM completely. Or, as a more recent example, we set up page tables which does virtual memory. How do you detect these kind of things? Mm -hmm. Um, so currently, um, this prototype doesn't do um, these things on the architecture level, which are kind of into, baked into the core of the architecture. So what we, for example, implement is the, the interop controller. So um, for enabling and setting um, priorities for interrupts, uh, we still uh, give this uh, architecture level, uh, com these architecture level components and this functionality and have this uh, done by the emulator itself. So what we can do then is that we can, if we know the um, the architecture on a very broad scale, then uh, we can create an emulator which um, has these core components in it, something which um, the architecture cannot do without and would have these represented by that. And then the modeling of the MMIO afterwards would be something uh, done via the models. So you could adjust some of these things by hand for the emulator you would create um, this, these core components once, for example, for the um, 
for interrupt controlling and so on, and um, then do this to fast test any um, component which is um, working on, on this kind of base architecture. Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, the differences uh, between a uh, um, piece of hardware and interfaces, uh, I saw uh, that you have kind of profiles uh, uh, based. Yeah, the, the tool uh, uses uh, profiles where uh, you can take from documentation uh, the addresses uh, and uh, you handle in this way, right? Uh, it, yeah, what you do to set the, the base emulation up is that you supply some base memory ranges in that case, that you um, kind of tell it, okay, where can you expect hardware accesses to be, and then where can you expect some RAM to be, and where is the code loaded. This is kind of the base assumption that you need to know where are things based quite roughly. Not um, You do not need to know where some MMIO ranges are or any ranges like this, um, but you have to know the broad uh, memory range where things could occur and then I uh, listen for these successes. Oh, okay, no, um, I, I was asking uh, uh, more specifically if mm -hmm. uh, you're uh, providing uh, uh, addresses for specific uh, uh, interfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we can also talk about this uh, afterwards. If I have not understood your question correctly, that's very fine. I'm sure it's a good one, so. Hey, thanks for your talk. Group never uh, disappoints. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I didn't get that right, but how do you uh, create the constraints for your model? Is this manual work, or is this being computed with like? I didn't. I didn't um, explain the one symbol on the right, which is was the symbol for anger. And it was uh, maybe it was implicit from my side, but it's it's dynamic symbolic execution that we're okay, using, yeah. kind of in the in the context of we're taking a snapshot of what's going on in the emulator, mm -hmm. and then just look at this very specific okay, yeah. access and just have to step a couple of times to not kind of so have it's to run through completely the, automated. Yeah, this is oh, all okay. complete. Yeah, very good. which we also Thanks. saw with the in the demo where the these models yeah. popped up, it was also mm -hmm. an automated process. Mm -hmm. Would uh, modeling not be uh, useful by uh, non-firmware software? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, also a very good question. I have not always said that, but uh, these questions were really good um, and valid. Uh, this one is actually something which we could also um, apply in non-firmware uh, environments. The, the bit different or the kind of difference here is that for MIO accesses, what we have is an access which is very local and very short-lived. So we have one MMIO access to register, we use it, this operation, for example, and then discard the value afterwards. So what we can do is we can do the analysis in a very confined space. So we do just have to look at this one function or some basic blocks of this, this function to see what it does. Um, what we could also do for um, software in the non-firmware space is that we um, have this type of model as well and then fix some values in place, for example, or have some... Um, some kind of grammar description maybe coming out of this modeling that we say, okay, this this field can either be that or the other one, and then we have the fuzzer just give us some input, and then we look at these fields, and then based on what the fuzzer gives us, we insert the right choice and kind of do the same modeling, maybe in place of where the input starts uh, being fed in, or maybe in the place of um, the fuzzing process itself where we inject some code or like uh, um, some listeners or things like that. I, I could see that, yeah. It just has a bit more um, it's not that natural to, to do it in that case because it just has a more, it has a broader frame. You have to trace the data for a longer time. But in general, this is, yeah, it's a, it's a good idea. All right. I think there are no further questions. If you have any questions, we can talk outside as well. So thank you again and uh, have a good break.